My name is Nick Hill and I'll be the host for today's meeting. So we plan on having webinars like this one very often, so be sure to stay updated. Our goal is to help as many students as possible, so we would appreciate it if you could share the word and, uh, and share the program to your friends. Today, we have the privilege of having Mr. Kali Yukula as our speaker. He'll be speaking about his job as a management consultant, and he'll talk about his work environment, educational experience, and more. Everyone will be given the opportunity to ask him questions in between. So if you have any questions throughout the webinar, you can click the raise hand button or you can send it in the chat. Now, Mr. Taliukula, we are very glad to have you as a speaker and uh, we would love for you to first give us a short introduction of yourself. Yeah, first thing, congratulations, Nikhil, for doing this. This is a great initiative that you're bringing in speakers for a freshman in high school doing it, it is, it is really impressive. I wish you that you would do many more sessions like this and probably um, expand this further. Thanks for inviting me here. Um, so I live in uh, Dallas area. Um, so I am, I work for Ericsson uh, in the management consulting space. So Ericsson has this uh, consulting group where we advise telecom operators like AT&T, Verizon around the world. So my job is to, uh, to advise them about the latest strategies, whether it is 5G or whether it is uh, fiber to the optics, anything to improve their business. So we do it uh, from a strategy definition perspective and also how to better run their operation. So for you all, you know, 5G is a hot thing, right? So that's, that's what is coming up. So any, everything and that is changing the game. So right now my activity is essentially uh, associated to that, I advise operators around the world. Thank you for that. So first, can you uh, explain what a management consultant is for those of us who don't know? Yeah, basically management consultant is somebody who would look at the strategic issues the company is facing and define a long-term strategy or, or long-term plan. They also, uh, so they can either do the planning from a growth perspective, how the company can grow. They can advise the company to address the major problems that they are facing, whether it is run how to run the business or how to ad address any technology uh, advances that they need to make or any, any pressing needs that the top executives uh, have for the company. So in a sense, Management consulting is about helping customers, uh, like in this case, since I'm special, I specialize in telecommunication, in this case, like AT&T, T-Mobile, Geo, or Airtel, companies like that, uh, to advise them to address their business problems and also to uh, plan for growth. So you mentioned that you help advise for growth in the telecommunic telecommunications field. So what do you do on a daily basis at your job? Yeah, so uh, I'll take an example. Uh, let's say if uh, right now, right now I'll, I'll, I'm working with uh, a telecommunications operator. I can give you the name. Uh, so they are looking, they're getting ready for launching uh, 5G, right? So what kind of products that they need to launch? So 5G requires a lot of investment, but at the same time, uh, they need to have a solid plan, a long-term strategy, long-term plan to realize those investments. First thing is what type of uh, uh, business models that they need to invest in, what type of, uh, what kind of plans that they need to have in order to launch the products that they need to launch Hope I'm making sense. Yes. So somebody's so, coming up with. Yeah. Yes. So I to hope, get to. I'll take an example. Go on. Go on. Yes. To to get to your current position, what education or degrees did you need? So it's it's not like you need a, a special degree, but essentially you need a, a good experience and education in sciences in general, right? Whether it is engineering, uh, that engineering could be from 
communications or, or electrical engineering, computer science, or it could be a software engineering, or it could be a general engineering. Engineering is preferred. Uh, at the same time, uh, business education is is, uh, is very much needed. There are people who who get to management consulting without MBA, but majority of the the best path is to get an MBA. So, what drew you to this field of management consulting? Was there something that appealed to you, or so more than management consulting? It is the the telecommunications, which is my passion. I used to work for Verizon right here in uh, Dallas. So I started my career there, not in consulting, right, in engineering. Uh, and then while, uh, after getting some experience, I got my MBA from Southern Methodist University, right here in Dallas. And that kind of prompted me to uh, look for paths where it, I can address big picture problems or bigger problems. So I did, I, take, I took internal changes within uh, Verizon, um, where there is a discipline called enterprise architecture. So essentially it is looking at, from a technology point of view, looking at the big picture. That was my first job after getting my MBA. So um, that was my way into internal consulting, consulting within uh, Verizon. And then I left Verizon to join another consulting company. So my, uh, the best thing that I like about it is combining with my passion of passion for telecommunications, the latest in the telecommunications business uh, from a business point of view, um, and to help different customers, uh, different telecommunication operators, telecommunication companies. Uh, and uh, this job right now, I mean, the current job that I am in, I took this uh, six years ago. Since then, I've been helping telecommunications providers or telecommunications companies around the world. So that the combination of travel, uh, taking up new problems, it, uh, along with telecommunications is what you know appeals to me. So I've heard that many management consultants travel a lot on a weekly basis to uh, consult with different uh, projects. So do you travel a lot for your work? I travel a lot, right? So my first consulting job was uh, within the US, so US consulting. So I used to travel every week, typically fly in on a Monday morning and then come back on Thursday night. So uh, with that job uh, or, or in that role, I worked with uh, telecommunications companies within the US. Uh, so this current role is, pa I'm part of global consulting. So where my responsibility is to support telecommunications companies around the world. So our group, small group of uh, consultants, we support around the world. So my travel is now longer because of the longer distances. I pretty much travel to every part of the world or all the four, con all the continents except for uh, Australia and Antarctica. So, so imagine traveling to working with a customer in Vietnam, for example, that takes a lot of uh, travel. So yes, my job, uh, you know, takes me to places around the world. It is uh, sometimes can get ten years, but at the same time, when you love what you're doing, then you will not feel the the stress that comes into travel. Most importantly, I get to see wonderful places around the world. As a company so, cost. So has the virus, uh, the virus pandemic affected your job or do you still travel? Absolutely, it, it, it totally changed it. Not just as the uh, entire company, uh, sorry, consulting industry has changed. Obviously people are not traveling, especially people from the US are not traveling. Travel has resumed a little bit uh, in Europe, but not our company. So our company has a mandate not to have anybody travel this year. Um, so luckily we have, man we are managing in, in a way where we are, you know, uh, working with the local teams within the country that they uh, are in and working virtually. So we would have our local people, say let's say Vietnam. So Ericsson Vietnam folks would go to the customer location within the city 
and we would work with uh, the customer and our colleagues in Vietnam, for example, uh, virtually. So it has changed the consulting industry drastically. Luckily, I didn't have to travel. So do you think that this, uh, this pandemic will change your industry for a long time or do you think it'll end soon? Like, do you think that it's even after the pandemic goes away, do you think your industry is still going to be affected and they're gonna still do some things virtually? Very good question, uh, Nikhil. Uh, absolutely, in pan post pandemic, consulting industry is going to change drastically, is in my view, because so far uh, people saw uh, I mean, virtually delivering the consulting services is not really a possibility. So the travel is not going to go away completely after things come to normal. But our customers have realized that. Consulting engagements, consulting projects can be done virtually also. So it, obviously uh, travel, I do not see travel will be 100% or Monday to Thursday every week. It won't probably go back to that because people started to understand that things can be done virtually. At the same time, it will not be 100% virtual. So somewhere in the middle, we'll be uh, arriving at an equilibrium with travel will be as needed, uh, even in consulting. So that's my personal view because uh, for younger people, consulting, I mean, travel is wonderful in consulting, but at the same time, it takes a heavy toll from a lifestyle perspective because you are always living in the hotels, um, especially when you have family. Like my kids growing up years, uh, I used to travel quite a bit. I mean, now I travel, but at least like, it's not as bad. My travel is longer now, but not every week uh, because the international travel, I, I do travel, but not like uh, every week. Um, so thing is, uh, when things come back to normal, it will be a better thing for consultants uh, because I don't think they'll have to travel the way they've been traveling pre-pandemic. So this virus has changed a lot of things. And this brings me to my next question. So. While we're here at home, um, we're like many of our school operations have been shifted to home as well. So, what uh, what skills do you think you need for your job that uh, even students can start practicing now? What what skills do you use the most in your job on a daily basis? Um, so, from a I'll first address uh, from a industry, I mean technology perspective, because I'm in the technology industry. Although I'm in management consulting, it is essentially the technology that takes precedence. So I'll address from that point of view, and also I'll address from a consulting point of view. So uh, every industry at this point, not just the telecommunications, every industry is, is moving towards technology. Technology is becoming at the center, is coming to the center of every uh, business uh, operation, right? Um, so my advice is for, for everybody, Irrespective of the major they select, to be little, you know, technology, technologically oriented, right? Everybody, I'm not suggesting that everybody has to code, but people have to understand a little bit of uh, technology, right? Whether it is, it is uh, whatever industry they are in, operational technology or whether it is IT, right? Uh, which is associated to coding software and all that, or uh, industrial technology. So having that technology mindset is very important. And from a consulting perspective, having the understanding or having a, an eye on the big picture is very key for consulting. So having that business point of view, strategic point of view is very uh, important. So anybody who wants to go into consulting, they need to keep, keep up with the business, uh, business strategies. Uh, they need to understand the macro economy um, having a big picture will always uh, help. So someone asked the question, uh, what kind of challenges do you think that mobile, mobile companies like AT&T and Verizon are facing right now? And how do you help with these challenges? Very good, very important question. Very good question. So one thing I'll say is if I'm going to go get to telecom into this while answering the question, because uh, first time I'm you know, doing this for high schoolers or, 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 or students, right? Uh, so please do stop me, right? If I'm using a lot of jargon. 
so in a sense the uh, telecommunications industry is going to change drastically um, so what we call business models are going to change um, AT&T and Verizon <clears throat> they'll continue to do what they're doing uh, they will start catering to new business models but they are already serving individual customers like you and me they're serving small businesses like a john pizza john pizza you know in the neighborhood or a doctor's office they're also serving other big corporations like a city bank so they are already doing this but the types of services that they deliver to them are going to change so the at&t and verizon that we know of are mobile operations right so consumer mobile but there is a lot behind beyond that and those business models are going to change this uh, what we call enhanced mobile broadband is a business model that's going to stay that's going to change a little bit from a 4g to 5g but 5g is going to introduce a lot of new opportunities for these telecommunications companies um, so if i would like to take uh, uh, t-mobile as an example because AT&T and Verizon have already been serving some of these uh, enterprise customers or B2B, what I said, business to business. In other words, AT&T selling to a small business like a John Pizza, AT&T selling to a large business like a Citibank. So that they have good experience with. However, when you look at other companies like T-Mobile, they don't have a lot of experience. So they are essentially used to selling simple mobile uh, or wireless plans to consumers and maybe businesses. And their business models are gonna change where they need to now need to understand uh, various products that they can sell leveraging 5G. Hope I answered your question without getting too technical. Yes, thank you for that. So my next question is uh, about how you chose telecommunications. So um were you always interested in telecommunications from a young age maybe in high school or college or did you sh slowly gradually shift to that field yeah um not really actually uh, my undergraduate was uh, in mechanical engineering right so while growing up i wanted to become an engineer i didn't have any specific view into what type of engineering uh, branch that i needed to get into um, uh, when I got college admission, it's more about the type of college I would get into. So based on that, uh, uh, I selected man uh, mechanical engineering because mechanical engineering would have gotten me to a better college compared to getting into electrical engineering or a computer science. So that was how that's how I got into engineering. And post engineering or, or during engineering, I had dreams to do an MBA after engineering. Right. So that was. During the engineering college, I was dreaming about getting an MBA afterwards. Um, I somehow did not immediately uh, got into a business school, which was a good thing that happened to me uh, because I come from India, right? So probably like your parents, uh, in India, the trend is right after engineering, people go do a master's, including MBA, but that's not a good thing. When it comes to MBA, it's better to get some experience and get an MBA. So eventually, I essentially, uh, after my mechanics delivering after a couple of jobs, I joined Verizon. So um, I joined Verizon in a software engineering role. The reason I got into software engineering is while I was uh, in college studying mechanical engineering, I also studied uh, um, information management or computer, I wouldn't call it computer science, computer systems. So I had some experience into software engineering after I graduated. So that's how I got into software engineering. And I happened to join uh, Verizon or at the time GTE. Um, and as I was working there, I developed a lot of interest for uh, telecommunications, especially back then uh, we at, at Verizon, we took up major initiative, like all the, if you live in, I think if you live wherever you live in, uh, if you are in, let's say, Irving area, you would probably have, you would have heard about FIOS, fiber optic service. That is a product that you know I contributed uh, to Verizon, uh, you know, developing and deploying that. I was a team in a team where we played a central role. So essentially, that 
you know, increased a lot of interest in me. So I developed a passion for uh, telecommunication. So a mechanical engineering, developing passion for telecommunications is where, for me, the lesson is when you enjoy whatever you are doing, you would gain those skills. I used to study a lot. I used to work with uh, others to know about telecommunications beyond my job, which was software engineering. Right? So I've learned a lot about telecommunications. And then I chose to continue in the industry to leverage the knowledge that I gained. So to you all, one thing I would advise is, irrespective of what your education is, uh, you need to have a goal. And in order for you to get to the goal, it may take multiple steps, right? So let's say you, you wanna, you wanna uh, join NASA, right? So even after college, if you cannot get to NASA, there are always opportunities to take multiple steps to eventually join NASA. That's what happened to me with my MBA. Um, immediately, I, I did not do it for various reasons, but eventually I got my MBA and gained experience in telecommunications. That combination helped me a lot. It was a long answer, but I wanna make sure you understand the full story. I give you the full story. Thank you for that. So yes, it is very important to set a goal and even if you don't achieve the goal, there's still other steps you can take to get around any obstacles that come to achieve the final goal. So thank you for that advice. That was very important advice. And that my next question is, so you mentioned how before you were a software engineer at Verizon, correct? Yeah, yeah. So That's how, how, how different is a software engineer at Verizon to your current management consultant job? Are there many differences or is it still pretty similar? It is completely different, but I've transitioned from my software engineering role at Verizon because uh, I was telling you earlier, after my MBA, I shifted from software development into, I was still in the software engineering group or IT organization within Verizon, but I shifted from software development into uh, doing other things, right? So doing more, business oriented uh, function. So uh, that was my first step, right? So right after MBA, I, I changed. Or in fact, in my second year of my MBA, I, I changed. And then um, two years post MBA, I took another role, which was essentially what I was saying, enterprise architecture related, which is addressing big picture. It's a complicated word, but essentially what it is, is bringing in technology business together, addressing business problems. So that was actually like an internal consulting. So it was, it is consulting, but as an internal employee. So that kind of gave me entry into consulting. So using that, I joined a consulting uh, group. Um, in fact, I, I joined consulting group within a IT services company. Uh, and using that, I got, using that, I joined a completely uh, full-blown consulting uh, uh, role, right? So, so transition was multi-step. So throughout the process, the experience that I gained in telecommunications was central to it. That's why I stuck to the industry that I am in. And somehow the experience that I gained as a software engineering was useful in the process. Uh, it is less useful now for me, but it is still relevant. Having, so key thing is that's what I was saying having the technology orientation will help a lot. So somebody who understands a business, gains like 20 years of experience in business, no experience in technology, for them to pick technology, it is difficult. On the other hand, somebody who has 20 years of technology experience and some business experience, they can easily pick up a business. Forget about 20 years, even like whatever, in my case, I was in IT development for like six years, right? And that helped me even today. I have nothing, I don't do anything related to software development, but it helps because every industry, technology, in every industry, technology is at most important. So even software is at most important. So these two jobs were similar, but also very different. And um, I liked how you told us that technology is important in many different industries, like even business like you were mentioning and so my next question is if you weren't working in this telecommunications field what other field do you think you would be working in right now hmm, interesting question look 
like i've been in telecommunications industry for 20 years and i enjoy it i love it so i can't imagine myself doing anything different but probably what i would have done is um i would have been in like somewhere doing a combination of business and technology so again it's difficult for me to answer it's been like 20 years i chose this path i don't plan to leave the industry that's where i gained my uh, you know equity uh, as in uh, the knowledge which is useful in every project that i do especially in consulting uh, but yeah probably somewhere combination of business and technology so um so for young children i mean young students who also want to pursue telecommunications in the future do you have any advice of things they can start doing right now or um, paths they can start taking to achieve that telecommunications uh, management consultant or whatever they want to work in telecommunications? Yeah, so telecommunications industry as such is changing. So one thing that is happening is any industry that you take, whether it is mining or let's take mining. So what's going to happen now is it's already happening, but it will happen more these mining companies are going to invest a lot in technologies that are closely associated to telecommunications. I'll give an example. Um, think of a big, large mining field, and that needs to connect to the headquarters, right? And in this mining field, mining operation, there are a lot of unmanned vehicles, right? Today, there are a lot of earth moving equipment, heavy equipment, where there are people are working in hazardous conditions, right? That's going to go away. Right, so there there will have there will be a lot of unmanned vehicles or a lot of robotic automation that's going to happen, um, and for this telecommunications is very important. So, so mining industry is going to invest a lot in telecommunications. Uh, same thing with uh, say manufacturing industry, right? Uh, they're going to invest a lot in telecommunications. So the telecommunications industry as such is going to change drastically. Uh, and tele already telecommunications op companies, I call them operators, uh, telecommunication companies are already verticalizing their business, um, right? So having the understanding of, like to your question, having the understanding of the overall advances in the technology, right? Whether it is artificial intelligence or uh, uh, robotics or industrial automation, um, or general automation, right? So having an understanding of software is very helpful. Right? So whether you want to be in uh, uh, telecommunications industry or not, it's going to be very important. So if you are in telecommunications industry, having an understanding of some of the industries or the big picture is very helpful. So the telecommunications that we know as of now, which is associated to iPhone, is going to drastically change. Um, especially with with 5G. So um, that that's a big point you brought up there that telecommunications is constantly changing with 5G. And that brings me to one of the questions that um, one of the members asked in the chat. And this question says, how do you see that 5G will change education field in different parts of the world? Um, we are studying these days uh, virtually. And how do you think that 5G is going to change for us in the next three to five years? Very good question. Again, stop me if I get too technical, right? So the future is going to be about uh, uh, liberating virtual reality, augmented reality, right? So uh, right now we are we are all virtual, but the tool set that we, we have is very limited. It's essentially Zoom and things like that, right? So uh, augmented reality is change is going to change learning where you mash virtual with physical uh, that's going to where people can say do experiments right so can feel things that are not in that room right so so that that's going to change uh, drastically same thing uh, associated to uh, virtual reality also so the learning experience is going to change in fact uh, from a i haven't spent a lot of time in terms of uh, uh, children education but we spend a lot of time in terms of how learning Changes because a human being will succeed only when they are continuing to uh, he or she 
is continuing to learn through the lifetime, right? So whether a, a training that is provided by their company or they're learning by themselves. So learning that happens until you get a college degree is one aspect, but learning that will happen later is another aspect. So that's called like continuous learning, right? So that continuous learning is going to change drastically. So think of somebody, um, uh, industrial worker, okay? So industrial worker who is working in a factory floor, they will now or very soon, they're going to work with uh, uh, using virtual reality, augmented reality tool sets. So where their uh, learning is going to be accelerated. Obviously video has changed the learning, but in, in future, 5G is going to bring in the AR and uh, VR and mash it with the uh, learning. So 5G Did is I going. Your question? Yes, you answered my question. So 5G is changing many, uh, many different fields, and so that leads uh, to another question. One of the people in the chat asked. They asked, "What is the advantages and disadvantages of 5G?" Yeah. So, is it from a consumer perspective or a company perspective? If you can qualify that, or you can you can pick a choice. Is, are we talking about advantages for users as consumers, advantage for users as a company, or are you talking about advantages for the telecommunications company? Which point of view? Pick a charge. Pick, pick a, take something. From the consumer's point of view, I believe. Consumer's perspective. So from a consum from consumer's perspective, obviously we have enough bandwidth now. Uh, for that, 5G is not needed. Right, so obviously 5G is going to bring in additional bandwidth. You know, all the marketing that is happening is, uh, you know, everybody is promoting about 5G networks. That's more to a, a marketing. Of course, five, speeds are going to increase, but additional, uh, you know, tools are going to come in. Like, like I was talking about AR, VR. Right. So think of you go going to a Dallas Cowboys game. So you're you are in uh, uh, the stadium, right, watching the game. So you would have along with your you know head, handset using ar and pro and uh, leveraging the tools provided by your telecommunication provider whether it is at and verizon t-mobile or dallas cowboy stadium so additional technologies are going to be provided to enhance that stadium experience so while you are watching the game using your phone you could uh, see statistics for stats for example you could see uh, you know, replay that is matched along with the reality, right? So a combination of virtual reality and augmented reality is, is, is an experience that a consumer is going to face, uh, is going to, uh, you know, experience. Same thing uh, with respect to healthcare, right? The options that the consumers will have are going to be a uh, lot. So in fact, since I'm talking to high school children or, or young people, I would say, Let's stick to AR, VR, right? So think of that experience that you would have uh, where you are watching in in real time, but at the same time, when you are watching in stadium, you don't get all the stats and you don't have access to the same thing that you would have, uh, you know, enhanced by commentary while you are watching at home, right? So imagine like com combining both. That's a good experience that people are going to have. So you mentioned a lot about virtual reality and augmented reality. So do you work on virtual reality and augmented reality at your job? No, uh, so for us, uh, there are, no, not me individually, uh, personally. So because uh, my role is to advise uh, uh, telecommunications companies in terms of the business models, uh, or in terms of the, the products that they need to select uh, or the technologies that they need to invest and how they need to invest. Virtual reality, augmented reality are one of the few use cases. We are looking at uh, hundreds of use cases. So uh, virtual reality, augmented reality are some of the use cases. Um, but we have technology team, like R&D team, who are working on, uh, at Ericsson, who are working uh, on those. I do not work, uh, you know, physically work on AR, VR. So as a management consultant, you work on many different projects, correct? Yes. And so are these projects just with one management consultant or are there many, many management consultants in each project? Yeah, it's always a team. So it's a, a team that is formed um, where you would have uh, a senior 
person, like a partner or a principal, um, and and then you would have uh, you know, a few consulting managers, you would have senior consultants or associates, it's always a team, right? So, uh, but typically when you are talking to the customer, it is some of the senior members who are essentially looking at the bigger picture and working with the team. It's always the team. Uh, and everybody is contributing. Everybody is, uh, you know, um, passionate. So that's where the, uh, the important aspect of it I wanted to uh, bring out here. The, one of the most important skills is, apart from communication interpersonal, ability to work with, uh, with the team members. It doesn't matter whether you're a managed consult management consultant or a software engineer or a doctor. Um, that ability to work with teams, assimilate with the teams is extremely important. Nothing gets done without a team. So in these projects, you said how there's a team of management consultants. So how long do the, each of these projects last typically? And are there uh, between different projects? Are there break, are there break periods between projects or how does it work? Yeah, so uh, typically the projects that are associated to strategy or even business planning are very short, right? So 12 weeks, 8 to 12 weeks or maybe 6 to 12 weeks. Sometimes we wrap up projects in like four weeks also, depending on what's going on. So let's say two companies are merging, right? Uh, and they want to merge. We, they bring in management consultants uh, like us. We go look at whether the merger makes sense, it doesn't make sense. So in such a situation, we need to wrap up very quickly. We won't have more than four weeks. On the other hand, they can bring us in after they merge, right? So after they merge, then we need to go into little more detail. Those, that engage, that project may last like probably 12 weeks or 16 weeks, okay? So at the end of each, we define a plan that they need to do, right? And uh, it's like peeling an onion. Right, so first layer you take out that defining strategy. Okay, the next layer is uh, you next couple of layers is about going into the next step, defining business operations, and then you take few more layers that's about implementing the strategy, right? And then you get into implementation of projects, whether it's software or network. So the top higher layer, like where it is big picture, short, the interval time is very short, right? So the four weeks and then becomes ten weeks. Next phase. And then the next phase uh, may become like uh, three months. It doesn't mean that the same company or same management consulting team is is working on all of them, is awarded all of them. So it varies, varies on what what is the context of the project, but shorter projects, not like months together. So in between these projects, so are you constantly working on this project and then as soon as this one ends, you start another one or are there break periods between these two projects? Very good question, Nikhil. So this is an aspect in uh, in consulting industry in general. Um, you know, seasoned consulting companies, uh, they don't expect, uh, or especially for the senior resources, so uh, they don't expect the, like I'm a principal, right? So principal is somebody who's who is responsible to help the customer from project's perspective, but at the same time, is responsible to bring in additional business, right? So business development is what we call. And also another responsibility is to develop thought leadership. So in terms of where the industry is going, because we focus on telecommunications industry. So part of my job, so I would say my job is probably can be divided into three pieces. One is working on projects, right? Helping customers with projects. Second is business development in terms of, uh, um, not sales, business development is a little different in terms of uh, making sure we have enough opportunities, having that initial conversations with the customers before they engage us. And then the third part of it is developing thought leadership. Thought leadership is essentially where the industry is going, what are the trends, um, what, what are the learnings that uh, we can uh, provide to the operators. Since I'm in a global role, so uh, one of the key advantages that we have is uh, so let's say a, some customer in Australia is doing something, right? So leveraging that, internalizing, obviously not talking anything about that customer, but taking the best practices and helping others, Ericsson companies, 
in other regions and also eventually other customers obviously not revealing anything specific to this customer right so that industry trends best best practices so to answer your question projects is only one part of it the other aspect is uh, also what we do between these uh, projects so you mentioned how you are a global management consultant so how many countries do you are there like typically the same country you're working like if you work in a project in australia or or are you working all around in many different countries yeah so that is a challenge so working all around many different countries the way the globe is divided from ericsson point of view we are divided into five market areas so think of them as regions right so uh, one of the, north america is one region mexico all the way to chile is another region so same way europe is another region asia is another region so at any time i'm working with multiple uh, uh, regions projects wise maybe one or two projects right but these projects are changing right so in fact uh, um, several years i worked to i i worked in chile or or several months i might be working in chile and then next project might be in vietnam and another project is might be in uh, uh, sweden so it kind of changes again that is that doesn't happen with every management consultant it is unique to you know our practice because uh, ericsson is a few is a global company we operate in operate in 180 countries so nature of the job or a part of that job is this dynamic of you know working with different countries traveling all around that that the challenging part time zone right keeping up with the time zone but it is fun always i mean the one thing i want to say is uh, the key thing for young people is when you are passionate passionate about something any pain is going to look you know like a pleasure so but when you start to not like something then you won't like it or, or you won't enjoy it i would say so you mentioned how that since you're working in many different regions so my question is if you're working in many different regions does language play a important role like there's many different languages and how does it work communicating between different languages we always work with uh, first thing is the customers we are dealing with typically speak in english because we are dealing with senior people in the management right but sometimes we work with people uh, you know working for the senior leadership they may not speak in english this happened a lot in uh, turkey and happened a lot for me in uh, colombia in south america so in the in those situations you know colleagues kind of help you so our local colleagues uh, who are situated there in some cases they provide us translators right and a lot of cases uh, you know you pick up the language like uh, turkey for example i used to travel a uh, couple of years ago uh, turkey and south america i used to travel quite a bit so i started picking up the language obviously you can't understand everything that they're saying you can make out the conversation so um, yeah so language skills is important you pick up uh, some phrases people help you and most likely customers talk english so those were most of the questions that i had is there anything else you would like to talk about that we didn't cover no i just want to stop here and say i may have used like i said i haven't talked to young children i give this kind of uh, talk internally within the ericsson worldwide communities or um, i mentor at smu but i haven't given to young children so i may have like talked a lot of jargon uh, anything that you guys didn't understand did i make it too complicated please uh, I'll, I'll, we can take this opportunity to address anything you know any anything that i i talked you didn't understand yes so does anyone in the audience have any questions for him about maybe anything he said or any add on questions that they would like to ask at this time you guys can send that question in the chat or So, well, if no one has any questions, um, yeah. I think that you did a great job at talking and uh, I liked hearing about the telecommunications part. And so if nobody has any questions, then 
I think we will wrap up. We can, we can summarize, we can, let me summarize. Uh, if nobody has any questions, let me summarize this whole thing, right? Uh, key takeaway, what can you guys do, right? So um, first thing is being passionate about whatever discipline that you want to go in, right? So starting from middle school to high school, right? So you want, you first thing is have, you have a goal, have a passion, even if you don't have anything, enjoy what you're doing, right? Let's say you have a goal of doing something um, like whether it is a major or as a career, developing that passion beyond the textbooks or beyond the classroom is very important, right? So reading about it, um, so that's number one. So once you have passion, whether it is to bread making, to making ro launching rockets or writing software, software, it doesn't matter whatever it is, developing that passion will make one very successful okay uh, you, you enjoy the life right uh, if you don't like whatever you're doing then you will not enjoy it right it, it's not good for anybody so developing the passion second thing is right out of so maybe when you are in high school you may not get the admission in the school that you wanted to go to in in, in the you may not get get the admission uh, to the major right, or, or the program that you want to get in, it's okay. There is always a plan B or you can get there. Somebody who wants to get into, say, for example, Stanford for BBA, I'm making up an example. It's okay if you can't get there, right? So there are two paths. You can get BBA elsewhere or you want to go, you are interested in Stanford, you can get into Stanford, take, an, take a program that can eventually get you there. Same thing with uh, when you take up jobs, right? So even if you can't get to the job you wanted to get to, it's okay, there is always a path to get there. Life is a, a marathon, it's not a sprint. So always think from a long-term perspective with passion, everything is possible. So thank you so much for the advice you just gave. And I think it's very insightful. And uh, I would like to take a moment to thank you so much for attending and speaking. I really enjoyed listening to all your experiences from your college to your software engineering job at Verizon to now being a telecommunications management consultant. And I think it was very important for us to experience that you've done all these different projects and how it works. It helped us to understand how, tele how the telecommunication fields work and how management consultants work. So I would like to really thank you for explaining that to us. And um, I think it is very helpful for not just me, but many of the other students over here also. So I would like to thank you for taking the time to speak. Thank you very much. Uh, great knowing you. I feel, uh, you know, it's, it's an honor to talk in this forum, especially the job that you are doing, Nikhil. Continue to do this. You are doing a fantastic job. I'm impressed. Maybe I can say I'm proud of knowing you. Uh, good job. Good job. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you so much for speaking. And Thank you everybody who enjoyed this webinar and see someone in the chat also wanted to thank you. The people in the chat are also thanking you. So I think that you did a great job today and I would like, uh, I'm so happy that you spoke today and everyone here was able to hear all the important knowledge you had to give us. So thank you so much. Thank you. Good luck. Have a good uh, weekend. Okay. Thank you.